Amen, amen. Good morning, Reclaim San Antonio. Yeah. We are happy and glad that you guys are here with us today. For those of you online, we welcome you too. We just ask that you uh, please click, share, subscribe, and like so we can get the word out what God is doing here in San Antonio. We're about to get ready to worship, so I encourage you guys to come up to the front as we, as we start our worship. Let's open up in prayer. Heavenly Father, we just want to thank you, Lord, for giving us the opportunity to gather here today to hear your word. I pray, Lord Father, that your Holy Spirit moves in this place. Uh, Lord Father, I pray right now that we are ready to receive. We ask you, Lord, that you anoint the speaker's lips and while well, he declares your word. In the mighty name of Jesus, amen and amen. As the Spirit was moving over the water, Spirit, come move over us. Come rest on us. Come rest on us. As the Spirit was moving over the water, Spirit, come move over us. Come rest on us. Come rest on us. Come rest on us. So calm down. Spirit, when you move, it make my heart pound. When you fill the room, you're here and I know you are moving. I'm here and I know you will fill me. Calm down. Spirit, when you move, you make my heart pound. When you fill the room, you're here and I know you are moving. I'm here and I know you will fill me. Open up the gates, let heaven on in. Come rest on us. Come rest on us. Fire and wind, come and do it again. Open up the gates, let heaven on in. Come rest on us. Come rest on us. Fire and wind, come and do it again. Open up the gates, let heaven on in. Rest on us, come rest on us. So come down, Spirit, when you move, you make my heart pound. When you fill the room, you're here and I know you are moving. I'm here and I know you will fill me up. Down, Spirit, when you move, you make my heart pound. When you fill the room, you're here and I know you are moving. I'm here and I know you will fill me. Will you meet me here again? 
all I want Is all you are Will you meet me here again? I'm not enough I'm not enough Unless you come Will you meet me here all I want is all you are. Will you meet me here again? Because not for a minute was I forsaken. The Lord is in this place. The Lord is in this place. Come Holy Spirit, dry bones away. The Lord is in this place. The Lord is in this place. Not for a minute was I forsaken. The Lord is in this place. The Lord is in this place. Come, Holy Spirit, drive on to awaken. The Lord is in this place. The Lord is in this place. I'm not enough unless you come. Will you meet me here again? Because all I want is all you are. Will you meet me here? Not enough unless you come. Will you meet me here again? Cause all I want is all you are. Will you meet me here again? Cause not for a minute was I forsaken. The Lord is in this place. The Lord is in this place. Come, Holy Spirit, drive on to awaken. The Lord is in this place. The Lord is in this place. Not for a minute was I forsaken. The Lord is in this place. The Lord is in this place. Come, Holy Spirit, drive on the way you can. The Lord is in this place. The Lord is in this place. Not for a minute, not for a minute. Was I forsaken? The Lord is in this place. The Lord is in this place. Holy Spirit, drive on to awaken. The Lord is in this place. The Lord is in this place. I'm not enough unless you come. Will you meet me here? all I want is all you are. Will you meet me here again? I surrender. I surrender. I want to know you more. I want to know I surrender, I surrender, I want to know you more, I want to know you more, I surrender, I surrender, I want to know you more, 
I want to know you more. I surrender. I surrender. I want to know you more. I want to know. again surrendering all surrendering all just find me here Lord as you draw me near desperate for you desperate for you I surrender I want to know you more. I want to know you more. I surrender. I surrender. I want to know you more. I want to know you.
holy, holy is He. Sing a new song to Him who sits on heaven's mercy seat. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. With all creation I sing praise to the King of kings. You are Blessing and honor, strength and glory, power be to you, the only wise King. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. With all creation. I sing praise to the King of Kings. You are my everything, and I will adore you. wonder at the mention of your name. Jesus, your name is power, breath, and living water. Such a marvelous mystery. to the King of Kings. You are my everything and I will adore you. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty who was and is and is to come. With all creation I sing praise to the King of Kings. You are my everything, and I will adore you. Yes, Lord, your name is holy. We honor you, Heavenly Father, Lord God, in this place. Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord God, for what you're doing in this place. We ask you, Lord God, just to bless us, see me, Lord God. That your word will come forth, Lord God, that we have open hearts to receive your word, Lord God we may be transformed and changed from within so we can be your disciples, Lord God. So we ask you, Lord God, just to bless us with your word. Let us hear the word behind the word. In Jesus' name, and the student said, amen and amen. Welcome to Reclaim San Antonio. Just turn around and just greet, greet each other.
unbreakable. Well, good morning, Reclaim San Antonio. How's everyone doing this morning? Um, it's good to see everyone here. Um, whether you're joining us in person or online um, on YouTube or Facebook, uh, we appreciate that. If you could please like, share, and subscribe to um, both our YouTube channel and our Facebook, we appreciate that. Um, and to everyone here, it's always an honor and a privilege to, to come together and worship with everyone here. Um, if it's your first time, I don't want to embarrass you, but if you can raise your hand, we just want to acknowledge you as our special guest today. Um, anyone here for their first time? Um, if you are, you should have received a welcome gift on the way in. If not, we can get one to you. Um, and so with that, um, I'm going to go ahead and do the announcements. So today is Baptism Sunday. <laughs> It's an exciting day. We have a few people um, who signed up. If you didn't sign up and you are still interested in being baptized, it's not too late. Um, we're going to have a brief meeting after service to go over that. So if you're interested, you didn't sign up, but you still want to be baptized, or if you did sign up, um, go ahead and stay after service, and um, Pastor Rudy will have a brief meeting for those who um, are getting baptized or you know interested in getting baptized today, even if you did not sign up. So we'll go ahead and do that. And after the baptism, after the service, um, and that we'll be gathering at our home to do the baptism there. And then we'll be fellowshipping, breaking bread together. So everyone is welcome to come. If you need our address, um, ask us or we'll, we'll make sure you get it. But everyone is welcome to come and participate. And everyone is welcome to get in the pool. After we baptize, we'll, everybody can jump in the pool because I'm sure it's going to be hot. Um, and so then we're also continuing the month of July with the sermon series, If My People. How many have been enjoying that? Yes. It's been good. Uh, Wednesdays, we have our worship and prayer here at the church at 7 p.m. Um, we gather to pray for our church and our community and one another's needs. And so it's an awesome time um, spending together in prayer and in the Holy Spirit. So I encourage you guys to come and um, participate in that. Um, Saturday morning, we have our Saturday morning prayer at 8.30. Um, that's from 8.30 to 9.30, and it's the same. We, we, we gather to worship, we gather to pray, and it's a good way to start your Saturday morning, a good way to start your weekend. Um, and then Sunday, July 17th, we have our special guest speaker, Pastor Mike Hernandez from yeah. Reclaim Hutto. So for those of you who may not know, we have um, fellowship churches in the Austin area. And so Pastor Mike was, um, I believe, the second church plant there. So it's our, our Reclaim family from Hutto. So he'll be here on the 17th. So I encourage you to come. Um, He's an awesome uh, uh, man of God. And, and you'll be encouraged. Invite someone. Invite someone to come that day. Um, so let's go ahead and um, give the Lord some praise as we prepare to receive an offering. Oh. Amen. Um, if you need an offering envelope, um, you can raise your hand and we'll get one to you. We'll have a basket up here where you can place, a, a, if you have a, a paper offering or cash offering. Um, we also have multiple ways to give that are up, up on the screen. Um, there's Zelle, um, our website, the Cash App, and also the Tidely app. So there's multiple ways to give. Um, and... Uh, if you need that envelope, you can raise your hand and we'll get one to you. Um, but with that, I'm going to go ahead and um, have my brother Mackenzie come up and take up the offering. Uh, bear with me while I open my laptop here. Hold on a second. Sorry. Sorry about that. Amen. So today I had the honor and privilege to receive the offering. Uh, when Pastor asked me to do it, I was excited, a little nervous, as you can see. I'm a little shaky up here, but it's okay. God will get me through it. With his strength, we can do all things, right? Amen. Amen. So I was pretty excited, and immediately when he asked me, I thought about uh, love and trust, right? Loving and trusting Jesus Christ. 
When we give our offerings to the Lord, we're displaying our love and trust for him. It's a symbol of our love. It's a, it's a reflection of what's happening inside of our heart. It's an external action of an internal work. Right. In 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verses 4 through 6, it says, Love is patient and kind. Love does not envy or boast. It is not arrogant or rude. It does not insist on its own way. It is not irritable or resentful. It, is not, it does not rejoice at wrongdoing, but rejoices with the truth. Love rejoices with the truth. And we know that Jesus is the truth. Jesus is the truth, the way, the life. So love rejoices with Jesus, right? His word is the truth, and we can trust in his promises. In Mark chapter 12, verse 30, it says, And you must love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, all your mind, and all your strength. When we give all these things to the Lord Jesus, we're giving him our fullness, our complete and entirety, right? That takes a lot of trust. It takes full trust to do that, to fully submit to someone in fullness. Fully loving Jesus requires that we fully trust him with everything. When we fully trust Jesus, we fully trust his promises. And the Lord makes many promises about our giving, right? He says he'll open the floodgates of heaven, which is so true, and it's happened so many times in my life when I've trusted the Lord with that. In Proverbs chapter 3, verses 9 and 10, it says, Honor the Lord with your wealth and with the best part of everything you produce. Then he will fill your barns with grain and your vats will overflow with good wine. Now notice, it doesn't say maybe this will happen or maybe he will do these things or he might do that. He's saying, no, honor me with your wealth and I will fill your barns with grain so we can trust in those promises. So when we give in fullness, we can trust him. It's a symbol of our trust and it's a symbol of our love. So as we prepare our offerings today, just remember we are showing the Lord Jesus that we fully trust in him and we fully love him in fullness. And if you still need an envelope, go ahead and raise your hand and the ushers will get those to you. Amen. So let us pray. So dear Heavenly Father, thank you, Lord, so much for this opportunity to show our love for you, that we fully trust you, Lord. And we understand and we know your promises when we give to you a blessing returns. We don't do it for the blessing. We do it for you because we know that we can trust in your promises, Lord. And for everything and who you are, Lord, thank you again for all of these things, Lord Jesus Christ, in your holy name, amen and amen. Come on, let's give God some praise today. Amen. Can you, uh, can you uh, fix my mic? I feel like I'm in a box right here. Well, we're in a little big box, I guess. But, uh, but thank you for joining us, and thank you, Mackenzie, for doing that. Um, uh, I always appreciate when somebody says yes, and it's, it's amazing to see God move in, in your life when you decide to say yes and, and do what God has called you to do. Amen. So that's a blessing, but thank you for joining us, uh, like we've said. Uh, we know that the power of God is in this house, and that's evident by you being here today. God drew you here, and he has a word for you. So I, I would pray that you would just allow him to minister to your heart. Just uh, uh, allow yourself just to, just to get lost in his presence, because we know the Bible says where two or more are gathered in his name, he's there in the midst. So God is in the The Holy Spirit is in the midst today. And if you allow yourself to fill him, so many things will, will, will bring understanding to you. You'll, you'll, start to, you'll start to receive what he has. And, and I'm a firm believer of that. Uh, we've been sharing testimony after testimony the past month and a half because we know there's power in testimony. We know that everybody has a story in here. 
and we want to hear that story. And so when we hear where you once were and what God has done in your life, it's amazing because we know that God is still moving. That God is still answering, answering prayer. He's still doing miracles. And we hear that all the time. And so um, when, we, when the Bible talks about testimonies, and then we know we're reading about it, but when you actually share it, it's somebody we know, or you might be sharing, you know, you know yourself, you've experienced that testimony. That you were once broken and sad and lost and were asking for more answers. And then all of a sudden God came upon you and things started to make sense. And all of a sudden the, the, the sadness you had inside started to become joy. The impatience that you had suffering started to allow you to become more patient. And how many know patience is a good thing? It, it's a process, but I'll tell you, I mean, you could pray for patience. Amen. It's a process. Amen. But I know this for sure, church. I know this for sure. That God brought us here for a reason. He brought us here to encourage one another. He, he brought us in here to inspire one another, to speak life into one another, to impart in one another. That's so powerful. We can come together because you might have been at home wondering if you should come to church today. And you decided to push through and come. Allow God to move in your life because he has something for you today. And if you believe that and expect it, it will come. And I'm a firm believer of that. And I've been talking about who we are as a church. Our mission is uh, with re Reclaim. It's Reach, Restore, Release. We believe that, that God has called us to reach the lost, to reach those that are broken, to reach those that are suffering with the gospel of Jesus Christ. And once they come, we believe in, in restore and restoration of the mind, of the hurt from the past, all those things. And once they begin to get restored, all of a sudden to release in their God-given gifts. And that'll happen in this place. And it's been happening. And it's evident when you see somebody working today, when you see somebody serving the worship team, somebody speaking, somebody greeting you in the beginning, all those things are part of God's plan for this church. Um, amen. And so um, I've been talking about this new series of If My People, and that's based on this scripture here. You'll see it up on the screen. Second Chronicles chapter 7, verse 14 I want you to let this verse, this, for this next month, let this verse stick in your mind. Let it minister to you. It's so important for God's people. 2 Chronicles chapter 7, verse 14. If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face, turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven, I will forgive their sin and heal their land. So, church, that's for us today. If my people who are called by my name he, he's speaking to his son and daughter. In other words, if they would humble themselves and pray, because a lot of times a believer will come to church, they, they'll get saved, and then, you know what, they're, they're, they're walking this walk with the Lord, but they continue to live the same way on the outside. They, they put on a smile for the church, but outside they're still, you know, dealing with stuff, and they're, and they're refusing to let things go. So God is talking to us and saying, if my people who are called by my name, son and daughter, you are called by my name, Humble yourself. That, don't take that as a bad thing. Take it as a reminder. You know what? To humble yourself. Let the pride down. Let the ego down. Let all those things that you say, oh, I'm strong enough. A little pride there. Oh, I don't, I don't need that. I can do it on my own. Some ego there. I'm strong enough. God doesn't want you strong enough. He wants you to call upon his name. If my people who are called by my name would humble themselves and talk to me and pray, pray. I'm still here. I haven't left you. Even though you might have changed your way of thinking, I'm still the same. If my people who are called by my name would speak to me, talk to me, and then seek my face, how, how much does God want you to come in and spend intimacy with him, uh, spend the time with him? Lord, I need you. Lord, I need you. Is this world too hard to navigate without him? Absolutely. Even as a believer. Absolutely. If a believer decides and he receives God, he receives the Lord into his life. Oh, man, praise God. You are saved. Salvation has come to you. But the believer that doesn't read or pray or fellowship, they begin to go backwards because now how are they going to navigate when there's nobody there to navigate with them to help them? It's, it can be a lonely world if you don't know the Lord and all that blessing that comes from receiving him. It's a great day. All of heaven rejoices when you receive the Lord, when there's a salvation. But don't walk alone in, in it because you're going to have questions. And if you try to read the Bible by yourself, yes, the Holy Spirit can bring understanding and revelation. But God gave someone a testimony to speak to you. God allowed somebody to have an experience that 
you might have gone through to share, to show you that God is still moving. That's the powerful thing of testimony. It's not something you read or heard, but something you've experienced for yourself. And you believe God is still moving. And I can testify to that. I knew where I was 16, 17 years ago. I know my mindset. You know, people on the outside didn't know my heart or my mind, but it changed. It changed. I no longer tried to get all worked up about something that the enemy's doing, not my brother and sister. A lot of people say, man, man, my, my I don't want to say my spouse. Uh, I want to say just my neighbor. Somebody gets me upset. They, they, they say things to me that just bothers me. But how many know that our enemy is not flesh and blood? The Bible says it's, something, it's spiritual. It's, it's, it's things in this that are not of God that, that stir you up. All those things can bother you, but we're, we're, we're busy pointing finger at the wrong thing. We're blaming people and not the spiritual things. And so that's why this is so important, church. That's why I love the title of this sermon. If my people who are called by my name would humble themselves, would humble themselves, let the pride down, let the, let the ego down, let that wall down and let me in. Talk to me, church. Talk to me and seek my face. Stop doing what you're doing. Stop doing the same things that make you frustrated. You're saying you want to be delivered, but you still dabble in it. Stop and turn from those wicked ways. I hear you. I hear you. You've asked me where I've been. I'm right here. I hear you. I hear your prayer. I hear what you want help with, and I'm right here. God, change this for me. God, bring this blessing. Do this what you said you're going to do. I will in my time, not yours, mine. You don't understand these things. My thoughts are not your thoughts and my ways are not your ways in my time watch me move in my time but don't give up keep seeking me keep praying to me keep seeking my face i hear from heaven i hear from heaven and i forgive you come to me come to me don't hold back don't don't say oh i don't need forgiveness i've already asked daily we fall short i know i do maybe you're perfect i don't know amen <laughs> praise god God says that, church, not to hurt you, not to discourage you, not to bring you down, but to bring you back up. Because the reality is when you come to church, sometimes we're a little down and, and beat up from the week. I know this for myself. On a Sunday, I'll come to church and I'll feel good after service. Oh, man, we prayed. We had church. We worshiped. We prayed together. I met a new brother. I, did, I met a new sister. All, and, and it's great. And then Monday morning happens. Oh, Monday morning got to start over again all of a sudden i gotta go to work and face that boss oh man i gotta go in that meeting oh no that's the inside thing guys amen love my work no um anyways what i'm saying is that tuesday comes around and things happen at work in your house you got bad news something happens monday tuesday something something's different you know and and you need a refill and, I, and you say i can't wait to go back to church on sunday because i feel good when i'm in god's presence but we have an answer for that. We come in here on Wednesday and worship and pray. And oh man, it's always a powerful time when we can worship and pray. Amen. So we're going to get into this message today, church. Because last week I was talking about submission to discipleship. Allowing ourselves to be discipled. Allowing ourselves to learn the things of God. Because that's, that's what God is saying in that passage. If my people are called by my name, humble themselves. Okay, let the ego down. Pray to me. Seek me. I will hear from heaven. I will, I will forgive their sin. And I'll, and I will heal their land. That's the beginning of discipleship. Because now you're ready. Lord, I'm, I'm letting everything down. Now I'm ready to learn. So we talked about submission to discipleship and seeking his face. Today, I want to go a little further and talk about embracing, embracing discipleship, embracing what God, has, what God is going to do for you. See, God called you here for his purpose. He called you here because he knows what's best for you. And so if the enemy had it his way, he would keep you away. He would keep you asleep in bed a little bit longer today so you wouldn't come to church. He would, he would prevent anything, he would prevent you from coming any way he could. So those that made it, I want you to hear me today, hear God's voice, and I want to show you how to embrace discipleship and why it's important. It's important for our lives. But let me read, my, my, uh, my text is going to be Luke chapter 14. So if you're taking notes, Luke chapter 14, verses 25 through 33. And I'll give you a second there. If you have your Bible or your Bible app, or if you have it memorized, amen. Luke chapter 14, verse 25. It says, Now great multitudes went with him, and he turned and said to them, speaking of Jesus, If anyone comes to me and does not hate his father and mother, wife and children, 
Brothers and sisters, yes, and his own life also. He cannot be my disciple. That sounds pretty tough, right? Amen. Let's keep reading. And whoever does not bear his cross, come after me, cannot be my disciple. Verse 28. For which of you, intending to build a tower, does not sit down first and count the cost, whether it has enough to finish it, lest after he has laid the foundation and is not able to finish, all who see it begin to mock him. Verse 30, and saying, this, this man began to build and was not able to finish. Or what king going into make war against another king does not sit down first and consider whether he is able with 10,000 to meet who comes against him with 20,000? Or else, while the other is still a great way off, sends a delegation and asks conditions of peace. So likewise, whoever of you does not forsake all that he has cannot be my disciple. Let's pray. So Father, in Jesus' name, thank you for your presence in this place. Thank you for your word today. Lord, thank you for the truth. And I thank you for everyone here to hear. Lord, I pray you remove all distractions from our minds remove all pre preconceived ideas, remove anything that would block us from receiving from you today. Lord, I pray right now that your word go forth, minister to every heart and every mind. It's all about you, Jesus. Have your way in this place. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. And so, so when, I, when you read that scripture, whoever doesn't hate their mother and father, their brother and sister, that sounds like a tough word. Why, are we why is he telling us to hate? But what Jesus is telling you he needs to be first in your life. So don't hear what he's not saying. He's telling you, forsake those other things. You say you love me. You say you trust me. You say you want to be with me. You say, Lord, help me. Do all these things. You pray to me. But, oh, man, I got to go take care of this first. Oh, man, I got to take care of my job first. Then I might go to church. I know, Jesus, you blessed me with a job, but I got to go there. I don't have time for this. Oh, I can't go to church because my kids have softball or baseball or basketball oh my kids i need to spend time with my kids i don't have time for you lord there's a pattern starting to develop all of a sudden you will put the things of this world that god blessed you with before the blesser so i'm going to dig in a little bit deeper here so you can understand what the word of god is saying and it's it's a, it's, it's a great message for a believer to know who jesus is you want to know everything he has for you i know a lot of people say i just want all that god has for me but i don't want to put him first I got priorities before that. And, there, and so, so a lot of people are like that. And so as believers, we need to count the cost. And I'm going I'm to talk about this today. So I just, I pray that you're ready to receive this word really ministered to me. It really humbled me. It really humbled me. I had to spend time with the Lord in order to receive all this information. Amen. And so in this world of, of chaos and all these things that are coming up in the news and, and evil's not hiding anymore, there are different role models coming up. Uh, uh, in, in our youth, you, you'll see some singers, some, some actors, some guys making billions of dollars in sports. And you're seeing all these things. All these role models are everywhere. Evil does not hide. It's there to take your focus off the things of God. We think about being successful, and we think of the world standard of being successful with money or position, career, all those things. I know so many people who have those things who are miserable. So why would somebody worth a lot of money, a millionaire, why would they be miserable? If somebody has the career they've always wanted in sports, why are they miserable? So they can have everything they want. And all of us, you know what they tell you? Money's not everything. I'll say, give it to me. Amen. But... <laughs> An athlete will complain about the tireless work that he puts in and doesn't feel fulfilled. There's a reason why the world says this is success, but the Bible says the success is your relationship with Jesus. You want true riches, you find it in Jesus. Because the world's riches run out. It's a facade. It's a fake. It's there. It's temporary. You want eternal things. You want the, the joy of the Lord in your heart? That doesn't come from riches. The joy of the Lord is a fruit of the Spirit. You can't buy that. You can't buy joy. You can't buy peace. You can try to pay for peace all you want. It'll run out. So you understand these things. We want this all from you, Jesus. We want the peace of God. Oh, Lord, we know you're the comfort that I need. Lord, you are the one that I need. I've been searching for. I love you so much. He says, come to me. Deny yourself. Ah, Jesus, you know I need this. So we want everything from God, but where is his, his priority in your life? 
Do you spend time with them? I can tell you this, it, it, in the first part of a relationship, if you're, you know, you're about to date and you're excited, you want to spend time with that girl or that guy, right? You want to spend time with them. If they say, oh, spend time with me, yes, I want to spend time with you. Amen. And, and those are good things, right? You want to get to know them better. You want to spend time with them more. You want to learn to build a relationship with them. You want to learn to trust them, have faith in them. All those things are good things. It's not bad things. God created us to be that way. But he created you that way to spend time in him. Do you see that? All those things you want to do, I want to spend time with him. God, wa- God gave you that desire to spend time with him. Oh, I want to learn who they are. Yes, God gave you that to learn who he is. Oh, I just want to have faith in him. Have faith in me. I want to trust them. Trust me. So he says, forget those things. The people that put their faith in the things of the world, they forsake me. But you have to forsake those things and spend time with me because you can be a Christian all you want, but are you my disciple? Will you go where I go? If I say, let's go, would you go? Or, oh, I got to spend time with my brother. Lord, you know my brother needs me. But the God's plan is greater and it's bigger. But a lot of people think in the world there's success here. Oh, I got to love my mom with all I have. Yes, you will love her better with Jesus' love. Yeah. Oh, I got to take care of my parents. Yes, if you put Jesus first, he will make a way that blows your mind. I got to put these, my kids, I got to do everything I can for them. Yes, you do. You will do more for them if you put Jesus first. You got to be the example. You got to be the disciple of Christ to show your kids what it takes to be a disciple and where you go in a time of grief, in a time of stress, in a time of, uh, of an argument. What do you do? Do you lash out and get so mad or do you pray? Because your kids learn that. Your kids learn what you do. Not just your kids, your siblings. You're, t- you're telling your parents, I just got saved. I went to a Christian church. Oh, man, the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit. What? We're Catholic. That was my experience. What are you doing? You got baptized as a baby. I did? I don't remember that. Amen. Like, what are you doing now? What are you doing now? Here's the thing. They'll start watching you. You go to a Christian church, and, what, and why are you still drinking smoke? You go to a Christian church, and you still talk about your sister and brother? You still cursing people out? What are you doing? How is, that, how is it good going there and leaving the other church? What's different? Oh, because you carry your Bible to church on Sunday, and you go to church, I'm good at church, and then you go back out doing the same thing. What's good at that? See, so we show our parents, Jesus is my priority, and then you show them how he's changing you, because now they're watching, and you're going to be a witness for him. And he says that, I want you to go out and be a witness for all the things you've heard and seen in my presence. What have I done for you? You need to share that. You know what the Bible says, and it's very clear, that the gospel message is foolishness. To those that are perishing. To those that don't know Jesus that are perishing, this makes no sense. How could you go to church on Sunday and spend time in the Holy Ghost? How could you do that? Church, they want the answer. They want to believe you. But do they see Jesus in you? Jesus says, if you're my disciple, follow me. Deny yourself. Pick up your cross. He says those things because there's power in it. We want to live like Christ. We want to be like him. He says, are you my disciple? You can be a believer all you want. I believe in Jesus, but do you follow him? Are you Christ-like? Are you that example just like him? That's what the goal is. To to come in, yes, you get saved, you receive the Lord, and you sit there. I want that power. I want that faith. I want to trust Jesus like these guys, because the reality is when you don't put those things into practice, how does that begin? I'm glad you asked. I'm going to tell you. I can't remember everything. Amen. Jesus was the perfect role model for your families. If my people, if my people, that's the beginning of discipleship. You know when discipleship, when it begins, it hurts. It hurts when it's the beginning. To to get saved, it feels good. Praise the Lord. The Holy Spirit comes inside me. Oh, man, it feels good. Then all of a sudden, Jesus, through the Holy Spirit, starts speaking to you. Oh, I don't know about that. I like that stuff. Because sin feels good, but it's not good. And there's consequence for it. Jesus called you to be a disciple, not a Christian. Go in there looking where he calls his people Christians. Where are all the Christians at? He didn't say that. He says, where are my disciples? If 
you follow me, my following me, my disciples. He called them throughout the Bible, my disciples. A disciple is more than a believer, church. It's more. See, and if you're new here, just hear what I'm saying because it's, it's a manual to lead you. It's, it's, a, it's a guide for healthy growth in this walk. Because I'm telling you, I said this a few weeks ago, if you come to church, praise God, first of all, that you're here, that you're in his presence. Praise God. But I'll tell you as a warning to a believer, if you come to church just to sit there, you will not grow. If you don't grow, you become stagnant and bored. And all of us, oh, I can miss church because I'm just going to go there. I'll feel good for a little bit, but that's it. You're just coming to here. That's the beginning then all of a sudden, the word of God starts to minister to you, and you know you have to do something. You have a desire. I need to do something. Pastor, can children's church or, or you know, the, the greeter or something. I want to do something. Yes, that's God calling you. Receive that. But check yourself first when God says, if my people who are called by my name would humble themselves. Look at yourself. Are you sinning? Are you living the same way on the outside and want to bring that in the inside? It doesn't work that way. It doesn't work that way. See, you want to come in and be used by God, but you want to hold on to the world. I'm not trying to discourage you. I'm trying to tell you that God has more for you. Because the reality is it's natural for somebody to come to church and just sit in church and receive. Amen. It feels good. Right? It feels good to receive. Amen. But God created you to be his disciple. He wants you to come to him. Somebody, where's my brother Oscar at? He's not in here. Amen. You can't ask that guy, come to work, sit down, and just get paid. He'd be like, what can I do? I need to do something. Let me wash your car. You got my keys. Hey, man. Oh, he's behind the camera. Hey, Oscar. I'm telling you, God created you with that desire. But do you respond to it? Do you become sensitive to it? A lot of people tune it out. I just want to go feel good. Yes. But let me tell you this. It'll feel good in here. It'll feel good in God's presence. But when, if you don't grow, when you go back outside, the, the same circumstance is out there waiting for you. It's still out there waiting for you. So you feel good in here, and you're like, oh, man, God's presence is good. Oh, I like talking to my brothers and sisters. I feel good. But you don't learn how to build a relationship with Jesus. You don't learn how to trust him. You don't learn how to have faith in him. You don't learn those things. So how can you take it outside and put it into action? That happens in growth. It happens in discipleship. Allow somebody to impart into your life to show you what they've done, what they've been through. Oh, come on. Amen. I got to read some scripture here. Praise God. That, this is why, church, we embrace discipleship. So I guess last week I was talking about submission. Allow yourself to be disciple. Allow yourself. Allow the wall to come down so somebody can speak into your life. Now, as we progress, embrace it. Don't get offended when somebody tells you you do something wrong. Don't get offended at that. Say, oh, I'm going to embrace my discipleship, praise the Lord. <laughs> Believe me, the truth hurts. Believe me, the truth hurts. There was a lot of truth spoken uh, in the church I came from growing up, growing up in, in the ministry. A lot of truth spoken. You want all that God has, but you want to hold on to what the world has. You can't do both. You can't do both. It doesn't work that way. So what happens? It doesn't feel good. And people get discouraged. I don't like to be in pain. I don't like to feel that pain. I don't like to feel that friction. I don't like to feel the sculpting or the, or, or the chipping away of all the baggage. We don't like that. I'm telling you, we don't like it. But we need it, and it's healthy. When a tree is dying, and, and, and all of my, my tree and plant people, my wife knows, if you see the tree dying, what do you do? Start to work on it, prune it. Why? You're going to see new growth. You get saved. All of a sudden, things are great, but you don't do anything to grow. And when, you start, when you're not growing, what are you doing? You're either living or dying. One or the other. You're living or dying. Are you growing or are you dying? One or the other. You make the choice. God gives you free will. You make the choice. Do you want to grow and live and get better, or do you want to be stagnant and get tired and become bored and continue to die? choice that a disciple makes i want more i want more i want more of you lord see the bible when it, when it says this and i'm going to go back to the scripture what i was talking about in verse 25 of luke 14 when the crowd was around jesus a large crowd it's cool to be around jesus miracles are happening he's calling people out he's giving words performing miracles and then he turns around and says to them in verse 26 if you want to be my disciple if you want to follow me 
And you must, by comparison, this is a different version here, you must, by comparison, hate everyone else. Hate everyone else. Your father, your mother, your wife and children, brother and sisters. Yes, even your own life. Otherwise, you cannot be my disciple. How uncool is that? You can only follow me if you hate everybody else. It sounds, man, that sounds hard and drastic. But what he's trying to tell them, he's saying this, your love for me has to be greater than the love of your own parents. It has to be greater than your dearest family. Because if you don't love me more than them, you will forsake me in order to please them. It's true that in, in, in your life right now, if you leave this place and your family, so, and, and, and I get it, the love of a father and mother, there's like no other on earth. There's like no other on earth. But that love is temporary. We need the love of the Father. And I'll, I tell you this, and I'm going to read through Scripture, but when you love them Jesus' way, it's a better love than yours. It's a love that doesn't run out. It's a love that doesn't run out. Amen. He said, by comparison, your love for them must look like hate. You're not actually going to hate them, okay? You're not actually going to hate them. You're not, but it looks that way. Your love for me must look like you hate compare, everything else compared to me. What a, it's, it's a tremendous statement. If you don't love me with everything you have, you cannot be my, be my disciple. What he's saying to you, if you don't love me that way, why would you carry your own cross? If you don't love me this way, why would you do things I ask? If you don't love me this way, why would you trust me? If you don't, if you don't love me this way, why would your faith be in me? If your faith is in me, that I'm, a, I'm the creator of all things, I can do all things. Why wouldn't you follow me? If your faith is in me, why would you put somebody before me? If you follow me, why would you put money before me? Why would you put things before me that would distract you from the things of God? See, those are the things we say at church, right? Don't get distracted. Don't, don't, you know, don't get uh, uh, excited about something now. Like, all this money in the world, the Bible says that, you know, somebody can inherit all things, all material possession, all the money in the world. You can, all the, all the, all the uh, riches of the world. But what do they gain if they lose their own soul? Because all that stuff is temporary. I know this, and I've, been, I've, and I've officiated a lot of funerals, and I don't, I've never once to see a U-Haul going in the grave, taking all their stuff. Verse 27 says, and if you do not carry your own cross and follow me, you can't be my disciple. But don't begin until you count the cost. For who, you would, be, for who would begin this construction of a building without first calculating the cost to see if there's enough money to finish it? I'm going to skip down here because to embrace discipleship, I, I, I want you to let this soak in, church, to embrace discipleship. We need to understand that Jesus didn't call you to, to be a convert. He didn't call you to be a Christian. He, he called you to be his disciple. There's a big difference, church. There's a big difference in a believer in Christ and then a disciple in Christ. I've heard this saying that, I forgot the saying. <laughs> See what I try to remember on my own, Holy Spirit. I'll tell you later. <laughs> Amen. There's a big difference between a believer in Christ and being a disciple of Christ. I know what it was. I was going to say that not every believer is a disciple but every disciple is a believer. That's what I was going to say. Not every believer is a disciple, but every disciple is a believer. Luke chapter 6, verse 40. A disciple is not above his teacher, but everyone who is perfectly trained will be like his teacher. Those that are discipled will begin to grow. Amen. Will be like his teacher. Isn't that our goal in discipleship, to be more like Christ? We're discipled. We want to be more like Christ. How, do you, how will you be if you're not discipled? Amen. The end result of discipleship is you become like Jesus. That's the goal. That's the end result of discipleship. I've, uh, I remember when I was going to seminary school, I was taking business classes as well. 
And, and I know a lot of the theologians are the, are the people that were anti-business because they wanted you to study theology and that's it. But I studied business and I got my master's degree in business. But there was always a running joke, you know, and, and they would always talk about the business majors and stuff. And um, it was a joke about three professionals among them. Uh, what was the first profession that God created? Amen. So one was a, a surgeon and he was like, of course it was surgery because in the very early book of Genesis, he performed first surgery on Adam. He took a rib out of him and made Eve. Amen. And the second man was an engineer. And he's like, what do you mean? That's not right. Long before that happened, God created the world. So he must have been an engineer to design it. Amen. The third guy is a lawyer. You're both wrong. It's true. He, he performed surgery and, 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 and the world was, uh, was created out of chaos and everything. But where do you think the chaos came from? From lawyers. Amen. <laughs> I say that today, and I, I remember that story, and I add it here because it doesn't matter what you decide. It doesn't matter what you do for a living now. It doesn't matter if you have a degree or not. It doesn't matter if you go to school or not. All those things, whatever you're trying to do in life, whether you're trying to get a career, you're trying to go to school, you're trying to, you know, whatever you want, you're trying to figure out the meaning of life, you will never discover it until you embrace discipleship. You will always want more, and people can testify in this place that have been in school, and God has called them out. You can, you can, people will testify they were on their way on a career path, and God called them out. There's so many things that happen because, why? Because they know there's more to life than what they're doing. There's more to life than going to school. There's more to life than having a career. There's more to life than just sitting around trying to figure it out. There's more to it. And you can't understand it until you become a disciple of Christ. You won't discover the purpose of life. Ask everybody. Yeah, there'll be, there'll be, uh, uh, they'll think, they'll, they'll be, what do you call it? Um, uh, uh, what are they called? Theories. They'll, they'll, there'll be theories of it, but they won't know. But if you want revelation and understanding, that only comes from the Holy Spirit. Amen. So I'm telling you, discipleship will cost us something more than just sitting around. See, the Bible says this, that Jesus doesn't want just a place in your life. He doesn't want just a place in your life. That's not what he wants. He wants something more. He wants to be number one. When you embrace discipleship, you know, there's always a cost. That's why he says uh, in, in verse 23, Luke chapter 9, verse 23, then he said to them all, if anyone desires to come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross and follow me. What does that mean? And we talked about this as cross bearers. You know, your, your, your cross is not your parents. Your cross is not your sickness. Your cross is not your handicap in your body. If you're disabled, your, your, your cross is not your background. Oh, I came from a bad past. That's not your cross. Your cross is, is not any of these things that we can think of in our human minds. But spiritually speaking, your cross is anything that would keep you away from Jesus. The cross, the, the meaning of bearing the cross, whatever it takes Je to put Jesus first, that's the cross you bear. Can I have the, the worship team come back up? Because I'm going to be wrapping up, bringing this to a close with, with understanding of who this Jesus is and the embracing of discipleship. Whatever it takes to make Christ first in your life. Whatever it takes. And, I'll, and, but it, and, and I want you to hear this. As, as, as we embrace discipleship and as we embrace learning who Jesus is, we become more Christ-like. He didn't say that, you can be, that, that you're going to be a very good disciple if you come. He didn't say, oh, you, you won't be much of a disciple or you're going to be a second-class disciple. He didn't say any of those things. He didn't say what type of disciple. He didn't say you're going to be perfect. He didn't say any of that. He just said, if you want to be my disciple, take up your cross and I'll help you navigate the way. Colossians 3.9 says, you have given up your old way of life with its habits. Each of you now is a new person. You are becoming more and more like your creator, and you will understand him better. You will understand him better. Embrace discipleship. Allow the old to stay in the old. Allow the past to stay in the past. Allow the new to set in. Develop new habits for living for Christ. Pick up your cross. Anything that would hinder you from building a relationship with Jesus, Make Christ the center of your life. Make him the center. Spend time in his word. John 8, 31, Jesus told the people who 
had faith in him. If you keep on obeying what I have said, you are truly my disciples. See, the word of God should become a part of your life. See, it's not so much getting into the word, but it's allowing the word to get into you. It's allowing the word to get into you. Spend time in the word of God. Spend time in prayer. We want to be at everything else in this house. We pray. We get a hold of the Lord, Holy Spirit. Make prayer a habit. Make it something you don't stop. You don't, you can't go without. I like what John 15, 7 says. If you remain in me, my word will remain in you. Ask whatever you wish and it will be done for you. My Father is glorified by this, that you bear much fruit. So you've proved to be my disciples. If you're a disciple, tithe. Tithe, because if you believe the word of God, my brother McKenzie said, God will open up the floodgates of heaven if you tithe. Don't hold back God's blessing and what he can do. It comes back many ways. When you tithe, when you give to the Lord, it, you know what, it might not come back monetarily, Maybe your need is, you know what? You're hurting in your heart. You need joy. Expect God to move when you trust him and put him first. Deuteronomy 14, 23 says, Bring this tithe to the designated place of worship, the place the Lord has, your God, chooses for his name to be honored, and eat it there in his presence. This applies to your tithes of grain, new wine, olive oil, and the firstborn males of your flocks and herds. Doing this will teach you always to fear the Lord. And that fear is a healthy fear that you would never be away from God. So you cannot have God first in your life if you don't give to him first. We always say this, you know, it's where your treasure is. If, if you think that your job or your, your car or your, your, you know, different things, if those things are where you need to put your money in first, then God is not first. When you put God first, watch what he does for you. And the last thing before I, I start to close, uh, fellowship, stay connected to the body of Christ. Be consistent with the body of Christ. You need to be in church and in worship every week, have fellowship. Can you miss? Yeah, you can miss. But I'm saying you need, you need it for your strength. You need believer friends, you need Christian friends, you need disciple friends, you need to fellowship with them. And this is the hard one just, uh, as well. When, when there's believers that walk away from the Lord, but they became your friends in here, and they walk away and they're out doing the worldly things, and we have believers that want to spend all their time with them because they like them. Oh, uh, you know what, uh, if I spend time with them, maybe they'll come back. That's not the truth. Only God draws them back, not you. Only God draws them back, not, not us. It's not us. To, we can't change anybody. We can't convince anybody. We can't convert anybody. All those things come from the Holy Spirit. Jesus said, follow me. Keep your eyes on me. Take up your cross. I like what Paul says in, in Philippians chapter 3, verse 13. Brethren, I do not count myself to be apprehended, but one thing I do, forgetting those things that are behind and reaching forward to those things which are ahead. I press toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. There's a prize awaiting the disciple. Jesus said, forever, whoever desires to save his life will lose it, and whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. It's such a powerful thing. If you're new to Christ or you've been coming a little while, I want you to hear what the Holy Spirit is saying. The answer you're looking for what you need right now is found in Jesus. He loves you so much. He wants the best for you. But sometimes when you want the best, it's going to hurt to take off the past. When he starts chiseling away, you're going to feel some pain. But we know this. When you're here, the Lord says, If my people who are called by my name humble themselves and pray. And I remember in the Bible, you know, we talk about embracing it. If you look in the Bible for those that were disciples of Christ, you see the pain they go through, but the strength they have in the Lord. If you know the story of the fiery furnace, when King Nebuchadnezzar uh, came in and he conquered uh, Jerusalem, so he took captives. He made, you know, made them slaves, right? 
But the Bible says he took a few. He took, he took the cream of the crop, so to speak. He took the, the, the wisest. He took the good looking. He would have took me. No, I'm just joking. Um, I'm just saying if you're awake. Amen. He took the best of the best because he wanted to impart into them. Can they learn? I want to show them. You know, I'm going to make these guys like us, right? These guys were disciples of the Lord. And I'm going to read a little bit right now, but it's, it's so interesting. These guys were captured. They were imprisoned. They were taken from their homes. They were made slaves to the king of Babylon. He brings them in, and he, and he wants to impart, oh, you know, I'm going, to, I'm going to take care of these guys because I know they could, maybe I can convince them to be like us. Maybe I can, I can entice them with the worldly things. So he brings them in, and, and Daniel, if you know the story, uh, there's three, Meshach, Shadrach, and Abednego. Um, uh, he tells them, you know what, uh, if we gain favor with our captors, then we don't have to do the things they do. We don't have to eat the food that they eat because it'll defile us back in the Old Testament uh, before Jesus. And so he's like, you know, he got gain favor. Can we not eat this? Just give us the, 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 the vegetables and the nuts, all that, the Daniel fast now. Give us those things. And they allowed him. So let me read a little bit to put it into context. But it's a, it's a story of believers that have been sucked in by the world. In Daniel chapter 1, I'm going to read 3 and 5, verse 3 through 5. Then the king instructed Ashpenaz, the master of the eunuchs, to bring some of the children of Israel, some of the king's descendants, and some of the nobles, young men in whom there was no blemish, but good looking, gifted in all wisdom, possessing knowledge and quick to understand, who had ability to serve in the king's palace, whom they might teach the language and literature of the Chaldeans. And the king appointed for them a daily provision of the king's delicacies or, and of the wine which he drank and three years of training for them. So at the end of the time, they, would, they might serve the king. Let me jump to verse 8. But Daniel purposed in his heart that he would not defile himself with the portion of the king's delicacies nor the wine which he drank. Therefore, he requested of the chief of the eunuchs that he might not defile himself. Now God had brought Daniel into the favor and goodwill of the chief of the eunuchs. And the chief of the eunuchs said to Daniel, I fear the Lord, the king, who has appointed your food and drink. For why should he see your faces looking worse than the young men who are your age? Then you would endanger my head before the king. So if you know the story, he told him, you know what? If he sees you looking, you know, you're tired, you're growing, you're, you're starting to age, you're, you're not looking healthy anymore, he's going to take my head. But the thing is, Daniel said, let's try it. Let's try it. And they tried it, and they were healthier and stronger looking than the other ones their age. So, so long story short, and I'm going to go a few chapters ahead, but it came to a point, point where Nebuchadnezzar, King Nebi, it's easier to say Nebuchadnezzar, King Nebi, you know who I'm talking about. He built a golden statue and wanted everybody to worship. Everybody to worship. His people and the slaves that he captured, you need to bow down before this golden statue that I've erected. The disciples of God, the disciples of the Lord, they had embraced what they had learned. Even though they were captured and they were enslaved, they would not turn from the Lord. Why? Because they trusted him. Why? Because they, they knew that God can deliver them out of the hand of anybody. Why? Because the Lord is faithful. Even though they were captured, Church, it's a picture of us, believers and disciples in Christ. We're trying to walk this walk with the Lord, but bad things happen and you get enslaved. Bad things happen and maybe your job, you know, they, they uh, lay people off. Bad things happen, you don't have enough money for something. And bad things happen where there is a relationship issue. And all these things where, where it's starting to be enslaved in these things of the world that we don't want to be in. How can this happen to a believer? How can this happen to a disciple? It happened to these guys. Why? Know this. Whatever it is, God will be glorified. And let me read Daniel chapter 3, verse 16. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego replied, O Nebuchadnezzar, we do not need to defend ourselves before you. If we are thrown into the burning furnace, the blazing furnace, the God whom we serve is able to save us. He will rescue us from your power, your majesty. But even if he doesn't, we want to make it clear to you, your majesty, that we will never serve your gods or worship the gold statue you have set up. So he had threatened them. Just like the world will threaten you. 
if you go to church, I'm not going to allow you to do this. If you, if you put God first, I'm not going to allow you to do this. And now, they don't say it those ways. But if something hinders you from what God is doing in your life, that's like a King Nebi in front of you. It's something that's trying to discourage you from coming to church. But they said, the disciples of the Lord said, does it matter? We don't need to defend ourselves. Does it matter? God can save us. He can deliver us out of your hand, King Nebi. Does it matter that we're your slaves? He can still deliver us when he wants to. But even if he doesn't, even if he doesn't, I will still never serve you or worship your gods. This made the enemy mad, as you can imagine. It made the enemy so mad. He got so mad, he told him, turn up the fire even more. Turn it up so hot. And, and he goes, I, I want to roast those guys. I'm going to show everybody what I can do when I get upset. The Bible says that he had them tied up, bound, and thrown to the furnace. The fire was so hot that the guys, the guards that threw them in, died. They fell on the floor and died. It was so hot, they died. They fell on the floor. And in the king's amazement, as he's looking into the furnace, his mind is blown. The enemy's looking into the furnace, how he, he tried to dis destroy the disciples of the Lord. And he says this in verse 24. Then King Nebuchadnezzar was astonished. He rose in haste and spoke, saying to his counselors, Did we not cast three men bound in the midst of the fire? They answered and said to the king, True, O king, look. He answered, I see four men loose, walking in the midst of the fire, and they are not hurt. And the form of the fourth is like the Son of God. It is like the Son of God. So church, when you get, come on, you can give God some praise. I'm about to get excited. That passage is so powerful. He's talking about disciples. He's talking about the men of God that, you know what, they, were, they, they went to church, somebody imparted to them, you know, things kind of hurt sometimes, but they stuck with the Lord, and all of a sudden they're living for God, they're living for God, and all of a sudden their circumstance changes. Did they become discouraged and quit on God? They said, no, we're in a bad situation right here, but God gave them favor with their captor. God gave him favor in their situation. So, so it's not over when your situation changes. You may not like it, but it's not over. Uh, maybe God allowed it for his purpose in your life. We don't know why, but instead of bowing down, giving up, becoming discouraged, they said, no, enemy, King Nebi, I don't care what you do. We don't have to defend ourselves from you. All I got to do is praise my God. I have to live for God. He has a way to make uh, this, uh, turn it around. He has a way to make it good. He's doing something in my life. I don't want to be discouraged. I don't want to have fear. I don't want to have anxiety. I don't want any of those things. But even if he doesn't deliver me, I will never bow down and turn my face on God. I'll never turn away from God. I'll never stop going to church because I know my God is able. But even if he doesn't, even if he doesn't, I will never bow down. I will never give up. The enemy got mad, just like he'll get mad at you. He'll get mad at you and try to take everything away. He'll try to discourage you. He'll, start, he'll try to remind you of the past. He'll try to think, oh, you're not good enough. Look what you did yesterday. Look what you did. No, you're not good enough. He'll get mad. He'll turn the fire up. He'll want to consume you. And when you're in the fire, trusting Jesus, the enemy's going to be blown away, just like King Nebi. He's like, didn't we throw her in the fire? Didn't we throw him in the fire? Why isn't he burning up? But instead, I see somebody with him. Church, what that shows me, and it's very clear, that the boys that were in the fire, they didn't see Jesus with him. He's saying there's somebody with him and he looks like the son of God. So when you're in the fire, know that you're not alone. You may feel alone, but your enemy will see the Lord with you. He'll walk with you. And it's an amazing thing when you can believe that. You know who believes that? Disciples. You know why? Because it's more than just being a believer because if you've never experienced it, if, you've never, if nobody ever told you about that, how would you know? If you never hear testimony of it, if you never read the Bible, if you never prayed, how would you know that can happen? How would you know what the Lord has for you if you don't get involved in the things of God? You say, oh, I love the church. I love to go listen. Uh, that pastor's awesome. Nobody? <laughs> Sorry. Let the ego 
down. Amen. <laughs> Humble yourself. Amen. Um, I know. I'm joking. But listen. It's so important. Yes. When the veil is removed and you believe, it doesn't stop there. That's the beginning. You're coming like, I, I like there's something different. My life is changing. I feel different. My mindset is changing. But the world doesn't stop coming after you. That doesn't stop. The world doesn't stop turning. Your circumstance don't go away because you got saved and you believe now. It's still on the outside waiting. When I say outside, I don't mean outside this building. It's in your heart still. When you leave this place, all those things that the enemy wants to remind you of. But when you say, Lord, I need you. Because the Lord says, if my people who are called by my name would humble themselves and receive from me and talk to me and spend time with me and seek my face, I will, and, and right there, you stop right there. He says, and turn from their wicked ways. Stop sinning. Stop talking about people. Stop cursing people. Now he might say, stop cursing people. So I'm like, stop cursing people. Stop gossiping. Stop dabbling in that. Stop messing around with, with the sin. Because every time you do that, you fall backwards, not forwards. Every time you go back to sin, you fall back again. And you come back, oh, I'm tired of going back and forth. I know you're tired. It gets tiring going back and forth, back and forth. Keep going forward. It's less effort when you're going forward. Because you got to start over when you, come, when you fall back. But the reality is, even if you fall back, you can always come. But people say they get tired of it because they keep going back and forth. Yeah, and understandably, that gets tiring. Try to run a mile, run backward, and run back the other way again. It's tiring. But the reality is, you can do it. So I would say this. This message today was for the, was for the believer. Because the fact that you're here, God drew you here. Whether you came alone or somebody brought you, you came. And God had his way. His will was served that day because you came to be in his presence. Whether you wanted to or not, you just spent time in God's presence. Whether you wanted to or not, you heard the word, word spoken today. And the Bible says that the, world, the word does not come back void. So every word of the Bible spoke, spoke to you, spoke to your spirit being. The spirit inside you was ministered to. Now the flesh doesn't like that as much because, oh, why would he say that? Why would he say, hate my brother, hate my sister, hate my mother, hate my father? Why would he say that the word of God says that in comparison, you can't love somebody before me? I remember my, it made me mad one time when my pastor said that one time. He said, um, this is the order of how you should serve God or, or, or love the Lord. He said, above everything else, God is first, your ministry second, and then your family. Oh, how dare him? My ministry before my family. Crazy. That was not from God. That's the first thing I thought. And he said, and he said, you know, that some of that probably challenged some people. Like, I would never put my ministry before my family. Never. And he said, don't you realize that your family is your first ministry? If you don't minister to your family, you're failing them. When you put God first, he gives you the words to minister to your family. So why wouldn't you put your ministry on top of your list to minister to your family, to impart the things of God? We hear it all the time. Oh, I need to uh, show my kids. I need to show my husband. Pastor, my husband's not coming to church. Minister to him. Pastor, my wife doesn't come. Minister to her. All, I hear it all the time. God first. Your ministry second. You need the words inside you to speak to your loved ones. You need the words inside you to speak to your captor to gain favor. Something that holds you in bondage, you need to speak the word of God over that and believe that the blood of Jesus can heal every situation. God's name above all, all names, Jesus. Jesus, there's no name above Jesus. God first, God help me to love you for more. God help me, draw me in, draw me in. I wanna hear you, I wanna hear you. Well, my sheep know my voice, but if you don't spend time with me, how will you know my voice? How will you know my voice if you don't speak to me? How will you know my voice if you don't pray and listen? Because sometimes prayer is two-way communication. If you're just talking, 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 when will you sit back 
and hear the still small voice, the whisper. See, church, I'm speaking truth today. And I know this, when I write every message, it cuts in my heart first because that was me. I don't think I ever would have humbled myself before the Lord. Because I thought what I was doing, I was being a good person. Why would I humble myself? That's the beginning because if you don't humble yourself, how can you stop sinning? If you don't humble yourself and acknowledge it, why would you stop sinning? So humbling is telling the, telling the Lord, yes, I know I need you. I need help. I can't stop sinning on my own. We're not strong enough to stop sinning on our own. That comes from the Lord's strength. So he says, my people who are called by my name. I pray after this series, you remember that scripture. Remember 2 Chronicles. If my people, remember this, oh, it's not up there. The title of this sermon series, if my people who are called by my name would humble themselves and pray, Lord, I'm tired. Lord, I can't do this without you. Lord, help me because I make too many mistakes. I'm not strong enough. I get tired. If my people would humble themselves and just talk to me and seek my face and seek my face, spend time with me, talk to me and spend time with me, talk to me and spend time with me, talk to me and spend time with me, that's when you're going to stop sinning. You can't stop sinning until you humble yourself and talk to God and ask him to help you with strength. You're saying, I'm tired of sinning. But do you humble yourself and pray and spend time with him? I know it's too hard to stop. Do you humble yourself? Do you stop? Do you pray? Do you seek his face? That's why it's too hard because we don't do those things. I'm tired, pastor. I'm tired of doing that. I know I fall short. I make those mistakes. I do, I do it. Okay. Well, it's time to humble yourself. Pastor, don't tell me to humble myself. I don't have pride. I don't have an ego. I'm a good person. Do you pray and seek his face? Sometimes. I prayed last week. If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and stop sinning, I will hear from heaven, forgive them and heal their hearts, heal their minds, heal their body, heal the past. Heal the broken, heal the lost, heal their marriage, heal their addiction, heal their finances, heal their relationships. Church, it all comes together. The Lord has brought us together. He's assembled us in this place for his purpose. For his time the Lord says now that you're in my presence I get to talk to you because at home you never talk to me he said, now that you're here can I have your attention now you've been asking me about work but you spend time looking at not looking for me you ask me about finances but you, you try to do it yourself instead of asking me you've asked me about your, your marriage but you spend time fighting and talking to me you ask me about your children because they're lost, but you, you, try, you try to do it yourself and you don't do what, you try to do what only I can do. Do you see a pattern, church? The things that you're asking for, the Lord says, spend time with me. Put me first. I'll help you with that stuff. But you have to trust me. How do you trust me? You spend time with me. Oh, you want your faith to increase in me. Watch me move in your life. Try me first. Try me first. See, the Lord doesn't mind weeping for you, but sometimes we're hard and we won't weep for the Lord. When Jesus came into Jerusalem on the donkey, and, uh, it was during um, the Passover, he came in, the Bible says he stopped and wept over the city because his people had not humbled themselves and they knew what was, they didn't know what was coming. The same people yelling, Hosanna, Hosanna, were the same people that yelled, crucify him, crucify him. Why? Because the world. Because the world hated him. 
and they joined because it was easier to join the crowd than seek him themselves. He died a criminal's death for you and me. When they hated him, they mocked him, they made fun of him, they spit on him. All those things, he had you in mind. The Bible said he knew you. He knew you in the womb. He knew everything about you. Now he knows the suffering that you've been through. He knows the torment that you went through. He knows the stress, the, the insecurities. He knows the past. He knows all those things about you. Now he has your attention because he says, if my people would humble themselves and come to church and listen to, to the word of God and pray and seek my face, spend time with me. Talk to me and spend time with me. Stop sinning now. I know you can't do it alone. That's why you need me. Because you need me to help you with that on my strength. So Father, in Jesus' name, with every head bowed, let's pray. So Father, in Jesus' name, we thank you for your Holy Spirit. We thank you, Lord, that you call us one by one. We thank you, God, that you'll never leave us nor forsake us. We thank you, God, that you call us to talk to you and to spend time with you because you love us. Lord, let every wall of division be gone. Let every chain and every bondage be broken by the blood of Jesus right now. Set the captive free. Free the mind right now of any mind game, of any strategy of the enemy to confuse, let it be gone. Lord, every heart that is open, let it receive. Every ear that hears my voice, let them hear you. Let them hear you. Let them hear you. Now let them fill you. Holy Spirit is here, church. Holy Spirit is here coming to rest on you, to free you, to free your mind, to heal your mind, to heal your heart, to heal the brokenness, to heal the confusion, to, to heal the doubt, to heal the pain. The list goes on and on. To give you rest, to give you peace, to give you comfort, to give you joy, to give you love, to give you uh, 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 patience, gentleness, kindness. Wow. If my people who are called by my name would humble themselves, and pray. Church, I'm going to ask you right now. If that's you in this place, if God is speaking to you right now, if he says, my people would humble themselves and pray, are you too proud to pray? Are you too proud to spend time with the Lord? Are you too proud to spend time in him. For the people in this house today, if you want to pray, I want you to come up here and let's pray. If you would make your way up to the front and just pray. You can pray in silence. You can pray out loud. But we're going to get a hold of God today. He's been saying, I want to spend time with you. Come and pray. Can we all stand to our feet right now, please? We'll stand to our feet. And if you would respond to God when he says, pray and seek my face, I want you to make your way to the front. Right here, you can spread out in the front. We're just going to pray before we conclude the service. I don't want anybody to leave until we just pray.
Father, in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Lord, we thank you for your presence. We thank you, Lord, for your love today. We thank you, Lord, that you're with us when we need you. Lord, we thank you, Lord, as we come to you, Lord, you receive us. Lord, we thank you, Lord, that you give us grace, unending. Mercies are new every day. Lord, we thank you for that. We thank you for that, Lord. We thank you for your presence. And we thank you, Lord, that we're able to speak to you, to pray to you, to seek your face and spend time in you. All those things, God. We need more of you, Jesus. We need more of you, Lord. Pour out your spirit over each person. And I'll ask this, church. I'm talking about believers. And I'm talking about discipleship. I'm talking about all these things. You're like, what is this guy talking about? Or maybe, you know, like, oh, why doesn't he stop? One of those. But I would ask you this. If there's somebody in here that's never asked the Lord to come into their heart to reveal those things that I'm talking about. If you've never had an opportunity where somebody said, if you want to uh, receive the Lord into your heart and just get right with him, if you want to ask him for forgiveness of your past, if you've never done that, I want to make that opportunity. So you've never asked him into your heart to lead you and guide you to be your savior. If that's you, I don't want to embarrass you. I just want to pray. If that's you, would you raise your hand? in this place. Amen. I'll go a step further as the Holy Spirit is moving. Maybe you've said that prayer before. Maybe you've uh, asked him to come into your heart, but life got in the way and, and, and now it, you, know, you feel like you're away from God. You're disconnected from God. You haven't been coming and, and, and there's other, other priorities right now. You just feel like you're not where you used to be with him. The Bible says we fall short of the glory of God. And there's no shame coming back and, and praying over and saying, Lord, just make me right with you. Just make me right with you. If that's you, you've said it before, but you want to pray again. Would you raise your hand and we'll pray it again together? say this prayer because I know I need to daily. If you want to join me in this prayer, just making sure that I'm in the right side of the Lord, come up and pray with me. I'm going to say this prayer. So repeat after me. Just say it to Jesus. Don't say it to me. Say, Lord Jesus, I believe that you died for me and that you rose again. And I ask you, Lord, to forgive me all my sins. Be my Lord and be my Savior. Come into my heart to lead me and guide me. From this day forward, I will seek you, pray with you, and spend time with you. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's pray. So Father, in Jesus' name, come on church, let's all pray. Father, in Jesus' name, we thank you, Lord, for your presence in this place. We thank you, for Lord, what you're doing in this house. We thank you, Lord, for those that have come today to spend time with you. Lord, you are moving mightily in this house. Lord, you are the miracle worker and way maker, Lord. We can always call upon in the name Jesus. Lord, we are a praying church because we know you deserve all the praise and the glory and the honor, God. And I pray your word continues to stir and minister to our hearts, God. Oh, Lord, move on our behalf, God. Father, you've heard every request today. Oh, Lord, even the unspoken request, Lord. And you're speaking to the, your child right now, the son or daughter of God. I'm praying you're welling up within them. Holy Spirit, begin to well up within them, Lord. And just let the praise of God come out today, Lord, as we praise you, Lord. We worship you, God. You are the one that we need, Lord. From apart from you, we can do nothing. And I pray right now just for a move of your spirit over your people. Father, do what only you can do. Father, we are limited in what we can do. But Lord, through you, all things are possible, God. And I pray, Lord, you would come on each person right now. 
Move mightily, Lord. Move mightily, Lord. As we worship you, Lord. We worship you, Lord. We praise you from the mountaintop. We praise you from the valley, God. We praise you from anywhere, Lord, because we know you are the one true living God. You are the one true living God, the, the resurrected King God. And I pray right now, Lord, for a boldness in our hearts, a boldness in our minds, Lord. I pray we walk with authority, God, knowing who you are and proclaiming the gospel, Lord, to those that are lost today. Oh, Lord, I pray right now. I pray right now. I pray right now. We worship you right now, Lord. We lift the name Jesus. 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 Come on. Let's worship him. Let's worship him. I'm gonna sing in the middle of the storm. Louder and louder, you're gonna hear my praises roar. Up from the ashes, hope will arise. His death is defeated, the King is alive. And I'm gonna sing in the middle of the storm. Louder and louder, you're gonna hear my praises roar. Up from the ashes. Hope will arise. His death is defeated. The King is alive. I raise a hallelujah in the presence of my enemy. I raise a hallelujah. Hallelujah, my weapon is a melody, I'll raise a hallelujah, heaven comes to fight for me. the storm louder and louder you're gonna hear my praises roar up from the ashes hope will arise His death is defeated the king is alive and I'm gonna sing in the middle of the storm louder and louder you're gonna hear my praises roar up from the ashes hope will arise His death is defeated the king is alive a little louder in the presence of my enemy of my enemies sing a little louder louder than the unbelief sing a little louder my weapon is a melody sing a little louder heaven comes to fight for me and I'm gonna sing in the middle of the storm louder and you're gonna hear my praises roar Up from the ashes Hope will arise His death is defeated The King is alive And I'm gonna sing In the middle of the storm Louder and louder You're gonna hear my praises roar up from the ashes, hope will arise. His 
death is defeated, the King is alive, and I'm gonna sing in the middle of the storm, louder and louder, you're gonna hear my praises roar, up from the ashes, hope will arise. We thank you, Lord, for your spirit in this place. We thank you for the truth, the word of God. We thank you for everyone here. Lord, bless every household represented. Oh, Lord, move mightily on their behalf. Father, I pray your word would minister to every heart in this place. Lord, bless them. Use them all for your glory. Have your way in Jesus' mighty name. Come on, one more time. Let's give them some praise today. Amen. Amen. Thank you for joining us um, in our Sunday service. It's not over yet. If you want to be a part of the water baptism, amen, uh, uh, you're welcome to come to my house. We'll give you the address. Uh, we live about seven minutes, eight minutes from here, and uh, you can come. There'll be some water baptisms. If you want to be baptized, and there's going to be food after, like my wife said, if you want to jump in the pool after, you can. Um, amen. So uh, that concludes this part of it, but the the... We want to be uh, in the water to baptize about 2 o'clock, maybe a little after. We'll see how we have things set up. But amen. You are dismissed today. Amen. Be a part of it. Get the address before you leave, and we'll fellowship together. If, if you're getting baptized in here, um, can you stay in here, please? <laughs>